Good evening, Aylesbury. This is astrophotography, or at least my take on astrophotography. And as you can see from the subtitle, I'm talking about taking pictures of the night sky, but preferably without using ridiculously expensive equipment. So what do you need to take pictures of the night sky? Well, you could, if you wish, start really simple. Just take whatever camera you've already got, put it on a tripod and take pictures of the sky. Then I'll think about telescopes and mounts. In other words, I'll briefly talk about ridiculously expensive equipment and then, having introduced it, I'll dismiss it and say a cheaper way of doing it is to think about using whatever camera you've already got and putting it on a star tracker. And I'll explain what that is when we get to that point. I'll be showing some of my images taken with a camera and star tracker and I'll also be describing some images that I took outside the UK on a safari in Africa. So let's start simple. What can you do with just whatever camera you've already got and a tripod? Well, the simplest thing you can do is simply point the camera at the sky, take an exposure of preferably many seconds or a few minutes, and then you'll get a picture like this, star trails. This assumes that the light pollution in your area isn't too bad and not completely dominated by local street lights. So this was taken a long time ago, a couple of decades ago, when I was still using film. So this was taken with slide film, a wide angle lens, and an exposure of about five minutes. If you remember the days of 35 millimeter film, we don't get all of the metadata, we don't get the recording of the exposures, the uh, aperture settings, etc. So I'm having to rely on memory giving me the exposure here. And to some extent, I can judge it from the length of the star trails. You can see here that Polaris is near the center of the image, hardly moved at all. And the further you go from Polaris, the more the stars appear to have trailed. And by taking the fact that the Earth rotates approximately once in 24 hours, you can judge how long the exposure was. But with digital photography, you can do more than that. You can not only take longer exposures, this is a more recent picture, and it's not one six hour exposure, it's a lot of, a lot of short exposures added together. So in this particular case, I took a whole series of one minute exposures. I simply set up the digital SLR camera, told it to take a picture every minute and just let it run. And it let it run for hours. This has the advantage that not only can you add all the images together to give you the equivalent of a six hour exposure, but you can, if you wish, use software, software that is free, to add the images together to give you a sort of a movie of the changing sky. So you get this video effect. Notice that the sky looks blue here and the grass looks green, which is a bit odd for a night shot. But bear in mind this was taken on the night of a full moon. And so the full moon is illuminating the ground, making it green, and it's illuminating these uh, white buildings. These are the observatories on the top of Mount Tidy. So you can see the stars are moving and even though Polaris is nominally at the North Pole, it's actually slightly displaced from the North Pole. So even Polaris itself actually executes a small arc as the Earth turns and the sky appears to rotate. That's always going to be the case, of course, if we're on a rotating Earth. If the camera is static relative to Earth, then the Earth is going to move relative to the sky and we'll always end up with some sky movement. Now that's not a problem if the exposures are short enough. For instance, Comet Holmes came by, uh, that was about uh, 2005 if I remember rightly, and as it passed the Earth, the coma of the comet expanded and it was possible to take a snapshot of the comet in just a few seconds. In this particular case, the camera was on a tripod. The tripod was positioned such that the camera was pointing relatively high in the sky and I took a single 30 second exposure. And so if the exposures are short enough, the movement of the stars because of the rotation of the Earth is not so much of a problem. And when it comes to taking pictures of, for instance, of the aurora, well, you can't choose when the aurora decide to show themselves. You can go to certain parts of the world where the aurora are more likely to be visible. This was taken from Iceland, for instance. But generally speaking, you have to be in the right place at the right time in order to catch an auroral display. 
Again, this is going back uh, 20 or more years, taken with slide film, a wide angle lens and something like uh, a minute or two or more of exposure. Stars don't seem to have moved much, so maybe it was a little less than a five minute exposure. But auroral displays can be absolutely spectacular, especially if you can get to more northern latitudes and see them in all their glory. For those that recognise various parts of the night sky, perhaps you recognise the Seven Sisters in the centre there, Taurus and the constellation of Orion over to the left. And another example of having to be in the right place at the right time is a solar eclipse. You don't need particularly expensive equipment. Again, this is just a digital SLR camera with a telephoto lens sitting on a tripod and snapping away various exposures to try and capture the wonderful structure of the corona that is only visible during a total eclipse. In this particular case, friends and I went to the Sahara Desert because we wanted to be absolutely sure of no intervening cloud. Unlike in 1999, when we went to see the total eclipse in Cornwall and didn't get a very good view of totality. So you don't need spectacular equipment to see amazing things like the northern lights and solar eclipses, but they only come along every once in a while. Let's have a think about taking other pictures from the UK. What telescopes and mounts might you think about? And this is where we get into the territory of ridiculously expensive equipment. So let's start at the most ridiculous end. Well, you could say, I want the best telescope money can buy. OK, keep an eye on eBay because the Hubble Space Telescope is getting old. It's uh, eventually going to be sold off. Perhaps it's going to be destroyed, but you never know. They might try and sell it first. If you've got a few billion dollars to spare, even second hand, it's not going to be cheap. You can, of course, obtain wonderful images. If you haven't got a few billion dollars, you can think a little cheaper if you wish. For instance, uh, another piece of equipment that is being decommissioned is SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. This 747 has got a big telescope in the back here. You can see it peeking through the open door there. This observatory has recently been de decommissioned a few months ago. I'm not sure if they're going to sell it off, but if you've got $100 million to spare, keep an eye open for it. If you've only got a million dollars or a million pounds, well, there's always robotic telescopes. For instance, the Liverpool Telescope, the world's largest robotic telescope, which is sitting on the island of La Palma. That's a rather expensive telescope to buy, but bear in mind that you can actually use telescopes like this robotically. There are lots of robotic telescopes around the world, not all as large as the Liverpool telescope, but there are lots of them around the world and you don't need to buy them. You can effectively rent them. You can pay for a few hours use of these telescopes has the advantage that if you happen to use a telescope on the other side of the world, then perhaps it'll be imaging during daytime rather than during your night time. So there are other possibilities. What if you have a more modest sum of money available? And modest means anywhere from a few hundred to tens of thousands of pounds. Even amateur telescopes can be horrendously expensive. And it's very confusing to try and work out which telescope you ought to be buying to either observe the objects that you're interested in, or perhaps you're interested in doing some astrophotography using telescopes. So some people will buy an amateur telescope such as this one. Uh, it will cost you at least a thousand pounds, possibly a few thousand pounds. Some people use them purely for doing visual astronomy, but a lot of amateurs will buy a telescope like this and then put all sorts of garbage on it to try and take images. So you end up with tech spaghetti because of dew heaters, because of cameras, maybe filter wheels, maybe other power supplies. And it can end up a lot more complicated than this particular image indicates. And many amateurs would say, well, if you're going to think about doing astrophotography, it's not only the quality of the optics you need to consider. They would adv advocate the use of a telescope mount that is the most sturdy and most precise that you can possibly afford. For instance, if you've only got a certain sum of money, you ought to be thinking of 
the majority of that going into the mount and the minority going into the telescope. You can always upgrade the telescope later uh, if your mount is sturdy enough to take a heavy weight. So that's good advice. Always make sure you've got a good solid mount. If you want to track the sky and not just take star trails, you've got to make sure you do it reasonably precisely. But whether people really think that it's worth $10,000 for a really sturdy, precise mount, well, that's basically up to you. Obviously, it depends on how deep your pockets are. So choosing a telescope is a bit of a minefield. Choosing a mount to put it on can be equally confusing. And in a separate short talk, I give some guidance as to how you might go about choosing the right telescope for you. But here we're not talking about choosing telescopes. We're talking about how to do astrophotography without splashing too much cash. If you did decide to buy a telescope, well, where would you put it? Um, it would be nice to have the sort of uh, space indicated here. This is Mount Palomar in California. I visited the dome of the five meter Hale telescope back in 1982. That's me as a student with slightly longer hair. I decided that uh, when I grew up, I would definitely want to have an observatory in my back garden, at least as big as that. Well, I had to downsize slightly and my aspirations were somewhat curtailed. So uh, back in 1998, I had a a shed converted into an observatory where I had a Mead telescope. Now the Mead telescope might not have changed that much over the years, but you can tell this is an old photograph from the fact that the laptop sitting behind it looks like a brick rather than the slimline sort of laptops that we would expect these days. And using that telescope, I could take pictures of the moon and planets and other objects. This picture of the moon, bear in mind that the moon is sometimes underrated. It does get in the way of looking at the darkest skies, and so some people curse a full moon for stopping you being able to photograph other objects. But the moon itself can be a fascinating object to watch or photograph. Watching the shadows and the craters of the mountains changing from night to night can be fantastic. This particular image of the moon was taken with the telescope I've just shown you, and it's the only image this evening that I've taken with a telescope. For the rest of the talk, I'm telling you how, can, how you can do it rather more cheaply. So let's move on from the ridiculous expense of telescopes and mounts and think about cheaper ways of doing astrophotography. Let's have a think about cameras and star trackers. First, a little bit of background to make sure we understand the difference. If we have a monochromatic film, a black and white film, or a monochromatic CCD chip, then we might use a lens or possibly a mirror to focus the light onto that uh, film or chip to produce an image. If we want to do colour imaging using either black and white film or a black and white CCD chip, then we would introduce colour filters in turn and take three images, one in red, one in green and one in blue, and then combine them using a bit of software, either free or paid for, that will produce the colour image that you desire. Of course, we don't all use monochromatic film or monochromatic CCDs. Colour film emotion, uh, emulsions came along. I couldn't afford them when I was young. I did my early photography in black and white. but colour film emulsions had different filters embedded within the emulsion themselves. With digital photography, the filters are actually on top of the chip. So the chip is still a monochrome chip, but there are filters on top and each pixel has a different filter. In other words, if we take a CCD chip and look in detail at what's going on, we see there's a particular grid of filters, often that looks like this, a so-called Bayer grid. And you can see red, green and blue filters such that when the image has been taken, you end up with a red image, a green image and a blue image. And again, software that understands how these filters are arranged can combine all of the information from the chip back into a colour image. So if you wanted to invest in an astronomical camera, you have quite a few choices. 
If, for instance, you've got a telescope with an eyepiece and you want the simplest way to take images with that telescope, then one option is to buy a camera which effectively replaces the eyepiece with something which is essentially no bigger than an eyepiece. For instance, a two megapixel color camera might cost you of order £250 or so. Take these prices with a little bit of a pinch of salt. If you want a more expensive, higher resolution colour camera with a better performance, you might spend thousands of pounds. For instance, this 7 megapixel camera is of order £2,000. And perhaps surprisingly, a monochromatic camera of the same sort of resolution, 7 megapixels with a similar performance, is actually a very similar price. In other words, there's virtually no cost difference between a colour camera and a monochrome camera. In other words, the cost of putting the Bayer filters on top of the chip is very little compared to the manufacturing costs of the camera. So manufacturers will often produce a black and white and a colour camera at essentially the same price. But if you did want to take a monochrome camera and take colour images, then you would need to put those coloured filters which aren't on the chip itself, you'd need to put those coloured filters in front of the camera. And that's why you would need a filter wheel. Here we've got a filter wheel with five filters and under computer control, the filter wheel rotates so that one of those five filters is placed in front of the camera to give you a colour image. So you would need to pay for the filter wheel and you might pay perhaps £100 or more for each of the individual filters, depending on what filters that you want in your filter wheel. So you can see that as soon as you get to modestly expensive cameras, it starts really adding up. Even putting to one side that you might have spent thousands of pounds on a telescope and perhaps thousands of pounds on a mount, you then have the prospect of perhaps spending many thousands of pounds on an astro camera. So that's one way to do it, but my question to anybody that's thinking about astrophotography is why not use the camera you've already got? Most people will already have a camera, not everybody necessarily. It's of course getting more common for people just to rely on the cameras in their phones rather than having a compact camera or a bridge camera or an SLR camera. But I was brought up with the idea of cameras are single lens reflex cameras and now digital single lens reflex or DSLRs. And many, many people will already have a DSLR camera. So if you've already got a DSLR camera or a bridge camera or a compact camera, why not think about using it for astrophotography? Rather than investing huge amounts of money in telescopes and mounts and uh, astro dedicated cameras, why not use the camera you've already got? And my argument would be that you can do a lot of very good astrophotography with a relatively cheap star tracker. A star tracker is just a device to move the camera to compensate for the rotation of the Earth. If the camera is fixed, you'll get star trails if you take long exposures. If you want the camera to follow the stars, you have to compensate for the rotation of the Earth. In other words, something has to move at the, re at the rotational rate of one revolution per day. And you can build yourself a star tracker. This is a, a star tracker that I built quite a few years ago. I called it K2 for reasons I'm not going to go into. It's one that I designed and built out of bits of aluminium, a couple of batteries, a little motor and a potentiometer. If anybody is interested in building one of these trackers for themselves, it would cost you about 10 or 20 pounds or maybe a little more, depending on what bits and pieces you already have lying around. If anybody would like to give it a go, I'll happily pass on the information by sending uh, the relevant links to Tom later. I used this tracker for quite a few years and then decided to change to a commercial tracker. I use this one, Ioptron, Sky Tracker. Other trackers are available. They cost anything from £100 upwards and this particular one was one that was available in 2015, eight or so years ago, and I've been using it ever since. It has a little polar scope on the side so that we can align the tracker with Polaris, uh, align it with the North Pole, Polaris being 
close to the North Pole. And once the tracker is lined up with the North Pole, then this object here rotates. And so a camera that's bolted onto this plate will rotate at one revolution per day and compensate for the rotation of the Earth. And that's how it works. You basically take your camera with perhaps a wide angle lens, perhaps a standard lens, perhaps a telephoto lens, depending on what chunk of sky you want to photograph. And then you plonk it down on top of your tracker, make sure your tracker is lined up with the pole, switch it on and off you go. The camera will move in the opposite sense to the Earth and hopefully your stars will stay pinpoint rather than trailed. This is precisely what I've done with my Nikon camera and I've used it with wide angle lenses and I've used it as in this inset here, I've used it with telephoto lenses as well. I've used it with lenses up to 300 millimeters focal length. What's inside a tracker? Well, essentially they're quite simple and you could argue why on earth do they cost more than 100 pounds if they're so simple. You can see what's inside a, a typical star tracker. Batteries supply an electrical circuit which feed a motor which drives a gearbox at exactly the right speed such that this worm wheel moves at one revolution in 23 hours 56 minutes. Remember, the Earth doesn't rotate once in 24 hours, it rotates once in 23 hours, 56 minutes. So part of what you're paying for in a star tracker is the precision of getting that rotational speed exactly right. And also the rigidity such that when you point the polar scope at the North Pole, then it's aligned precisely enough that the camera will track the sky accurately. So let's have a look at some of my images that were taken with a camera and a star tracker. So this is just a little portfolio and again a reminder that if you want to take rather nice images of the night sky, a camera on a tracker might be all you want to use because you can take pictures wide angle of the Milky Way such as shown here, a large chunk of sky with the Milky Way, there's the centre of the galaxy. Or if you wish, you can switch to a telephoto lens and get close-up shots of nebulae or a supernova remnant or a galaxy. There is a limit to what you can do with a camera on a star tracker, but it's more than many people will appreciate. Now, of course, astrophotography using a telescope and a suitably precise mount can be enormously rewarding. I'm sure you've seen many, many pictures in magazines on web pages of superb images taken by amateurs by taking images through telescopes. I'm not decrying the use of telescopes in astrophotography, but if you want to get the most out of astrophotography using a telescope, there is a steep learning curve. It will take time. It will take a substantial amount of effort and most importantly, perhaps, it'll take shed loads of cash if you want to get the really fantastic images that you see published in astronomy magazines. So my argument is that's a fantastic thing to do. But before you go down that road, you might want to try astrophotography using a tracker first and see how you get on. Bear in mind, if you've never tried this before, the sort of images that you see on the back of your camera, if you're using a, a digital SLR and you're using an LCD screen on the back of your camera, do not expect a short exposure to give you the sort of images that you see in magazines. This picture of the North American Nebula, that gives you an impression of what you might see on the back of your camera if you've taken a picture with a camera and a star tracker. This was taken um, from an area which was suffering from light pollution, which means virtually everything shows up as orange, simply because we had streetlights in the area and you can't expect to get nice white stars on a black background when you've got a lot of light pollution. But notice in the right hand pane that software can go an awful long way in compensating and mitigating the impact of moderate levels of light pollution. If you're in the middle of a city, there might be a limit to what software can recover from your images. But from an image like 
that shown on the left, software is able to make the sky darker and tease out the detail in the nebula and start to restore some of its genuine colours. In this particular case, there should be a fair bit of pink and a little bit of blue in that nebula. So software, some of it is free, some of it you pay for, but there are lots of different types of software that will allow you to process your images from your camera and software will quite often support all of the formats of lots of different types of camera, Nikon and Canon and Sony and Pentax and many, many, many others. So let's have a look at a few images. This uh, image was taken about a year or so ago. It's the Rosette Nebula in the constellation of Monoceros, just next to Orion. This is a sort of star forming region. It looks a little bit pink because this is mainly a hydrogen cloud which is condensing and starting to produce this star cluster in the centre. So these stars at the centre of the Rosette Nebula are relatively young stars being born. This image I took only fairly recently. This is only a few days old, this image. It has one very bright star in the centre, uh, this is Gamma Cygni, and a lot of fainter stars in the Milky Way. The night on which I took this, about 10 days or so ago, there was a lot of water in the atmosphere and I think that has contributed to the rather unsightly halo around this rather bright star. But even so, you can still see the nebulosity, again these pink hydrogen regions and a little touch of blue indicating there's some oxygen there as well in the background in the centre of the constellation of Cygnus. This was taken with a 300mm lens, you can see at the bottom here, and I took a series of 30 second exposures. To get an exposure of about 100 minutes or so, I never take one long exposure, I always take a large number of short exposures, so that if any images are spoilt by a passing aircraft, or a passing satellite, or perhaps passing cloud, then those images can be rejected and all the remaining ones added together by software to give me the final image. But looking at the amount of detail that started to show up in the nebulosity, this particular feature here on the left is called the Butterfly Nebula because it resembles the two wings of a butterfly. But I figured that there was quite a lot of detail in this nebula and depending on what software you use, there are various free bits of software that will allow you to remove the stars from the image and that might seem an odd thing to do if you're doing astrophotography. But sometimes there is detail in the nebulosity that is difficult to see if you have a very crowded star field. And so software will allow you to take the image of uh, the stars out. And here I've blanked off the very annoying bright star in the centre and the software has removed every other star in the field of view. And now you can see much more detail in the nebulosity itself. Again, you can see that there is a dark nebula sitting in front of this bright patch, which is what gives the butterfly its sort of outline of two wings. And there's also much more detail in this region where there's dark globules of nebulosity, dark regions that are sitting in front of these hydrogen clouds. So again, pink from hydrogen, blue from oxygen, and these dark, dusty regions are obscuring some of the other regions of the nebula. But this is the nebulosity you can get from a 300mm lens on a tracker with exposures that range from many, many minutes up to perhaps a few hours if you have the patience to expose for that long. So these were star forming regions, but this is a different nebula here. This is Carina, and this is effectively a star at the other end of its life. This is not a star being born, this is a star that's dying. It's still relatively pink because again, there's mainly hydrogen in this particular image, but this star has been unstable for quite a long time. It's thought that for the last few thousand years, this star has been shrugging off some of its outer atmosphere it's a large star, it's a very massive star, and it appears to be very unstable, and it's been shrugging off its outer layers into the interstellar medium, and it's forming what we now call the Carina Nebula. So the star, Eta Carinae, is buried deep within the cluster, 
beep roughly where my cursor is pointing at the moment. You may have seen images taken with the James Webb Space Telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope of the Eta Carina uh, star and its immediate environments. This, of course, is a much wider field of view. Note that it was taken with an 85 millimeter lens. So this lens is barely any longer than a standard lens. It's just slightly longer focal length than a standard 50 millimeter lens. And that tells you just how big these nebula are in the sky. You don't need huge magnifications in order to see small objects. Despite being very distant, they are so huge they actually subtend relatively large angles on our sky. That's true also of the Veil Nebula. This is a supernova remnant, so a star that's probably not visible in the center of the image, uh, exploded maybe 10,000, 15,000 years ago. And what we're looking at effectively is the shock wave produced by the supernova that's now expanding as this bubble of shock wave expands through space and plows into the interstellar medium. This particular image, again with a 300 millimeter lens, this, uh, this structure subtends an angle of about three degrees or so on our sky. In other words, this is much, much bigger than the full moon. So it's almost too big for a 300 millimeter lens. You might argue that you might be better off with a 200 millimeter lens. But this is one of the few photographs that I'm showing this evening, which was actually taken with a filter. Normally, I just use a camera and lens with no added filters. But this one was taken with a filter that lets through the pink of hydrogen and the cyan color from oxygen. And that allowed me to take this image, even though it was taken under rather light polluted skies. This was taken from just outside my front door. I live in a suburban town and there's lots of street lights around. LED street lights emit across the whole of the spectrum and they effectively light up the sky. But in this case, I used a filter, a so-called tri-band filter, tri-band because it lets through three wavelengths corresponding to two wavelengths of hydrogen and one wavelength of oxygen. And that allowed me to pick out the subtle features of the Veil Nebula, but the sky was relatively dark. The sky would have been very bright orange or very bright white if I had taken just a straight image without a filter. But the advantage of using filters is that you can take images even in light polluted areas and then the software helps by making sure that the sky looks quite dark. So I'm not going to talk about the different types of filters that can be used for astrophotography. This one happens to be a tri-band filter. You can get other filters that filter out particular wavelengths. And that's the subject of a different talk. I'll gladly send you the link to that if anybody, again, is interested in using filters for astrophotography. This is a, an image I took some years ago. It's the Rhoophiuchus area of the galaxy. It was taken with a 135 millimeter lens on a tracker. And it's uh, a little bit difficult to see, but embedded in this nebula here is actually the star Antares. Below it there is the globular cluster M4. To the right, we have Rhoophiuchus itself, which gives this region its name. It's a little triple star that's glowing blue and lighting up this blue nebula to the right. And you can see other nebula, especially this dark cloud complex called the Ophiuchi cloud complex that gives this area its name. So it's quite a colorful area of the sky because Antares lights up the nebula with a yellow orangey sort of tinge. Roa Fuyuki lights up its area in blue and you get the dark clouds as well. So you get this beautiful contrast in a relatively small area of sky that fits nicely within a 135 millimeter lens. There's also a touch of pink down the bottom here, so that would indicate there's a little bit of hydrogen gas glowing here as well. So color compositions are nice. Again, without any filters, a standard camera, a camera that you would normally use for taking daylight images, is perfectly capable of recording the colors of stars and the colors of nebulae.
If we want to move beyond what we can see within our galaxy, we can move beyond, and of course this is instantly recognisable as the Andromeda galaxy, 2.5 million light years away. Again, a 300 millimetre lens, one of my lenses of choice for a lot of these uh, outings into astrophotography with a tracker. So in this particular case, it was, what, 30 minutes of exposure, 30 lots of one minute. And you can see that you get a lot of nice detail in the dark dust lanes that surround the spiral galaxy, as well as picking up nicely the two satellite galaxies, uh, M32 and M1010. Is that as far as you can go with a camera and a lens on top of a star tracker? Well, certainly many galaxies beyond Andromeda are simply too small. They might be reasonably bright, it might be possible to pick them up, but you're not going to see much in the way of structure because you simply can't get the magnification. That's where a telescope would come into its own for looking at very, very distant galaxies. But this object at 2.5 million light years away is not the most distant object that you can possibly pick up. I wondered during lockdown, during the summer of 2020, when we weren't supposed to be going anywhere, and when we were supposed to be keeping two metres distance from everybody else, I did wonder, well, what is the most distant object that I can catch with my camera sitting on a tracker? Trying to put the two metre distance between me and my fellow humans into some sort of perspective, I thought, what is the most distant object I can possibly catch? So I looked up a research paper that catalogued lots of quasars. Quasars are the nuclei of galaxies that are emitting huge amounts of energy because there's a supermassive black hole at the core of these galaxies and they are emitting so much energy they can be seen from a great distance. I checked a catalogue and found one that was high in the sky during the UK summer months. This is July 2020 and I wanted the most distant quasar that is high in the sky so that I could photograph it. And I found one and this is not it in the centre there, that is simply a star, but that star, by looking up the coordinates of the star and the coordinates of the quasar, I determined that the quasar shouldn't be so far away from that star in terms of line of sight. So I put my uh, telephoto lens on my camera, put the camera on the tracker, and pointed it in the constellation of Draco, where I hoped to catch this very distant quasar. I exposed for about two hours or so. Some clouds came over, so I had to eliminate the clouds before adding up all the remaining uh, images, and I got a total exposure of something about two hours. That's about as long as you can get in the summer nights of the UK because the time from evening twilight to morning twilight is only some two or three hours. So two hours is about the best I could hope for. But according to the surveys that were done, the quasar I'm looking for should be just next to this fifth magnitude star. So I took my two hour image and then I looked at that region. Now you can't see from that what's going on, so I had to blow it up before I could see whether or not I had caught the quasar. And there it is. The most unspectacular image that I'm showing this evening. But bear in mind that most of the light from this quasar, the nucleus of this very distant galaxy, Bear in mind that most of the light I've captured here is focused into just one pixel. If I blow up that blob in the centre there, there you can see the individual pixels of the image. The whole image was something like 20 megapixels. That's the camera that I've got. And so the light from this quasar, it's gone into just a few pixels. And most of the light has gone into that central pixel so even though I had 20 million pixels to play with, most of the light from this quasar has gone into just one of them. But although it's not a spectacular image in its own right, the fact that that blob is visible at all, I find absolutely amazing. Because I checked 
how far away this object is. And the distance to this object is now approximately 25 billion light years, much, 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 much further away than the Andromeda galaxy. So it's no surprising that it doesn't show up as an extended object. But on checking the calculations of its distance and thinking about the expansion of the universe, this is a very remote object, so it's actually receding from us very fast. The Hubble constant tells us how far, how fast an object at a given distance is receding from us. The greater the distance, the greater the recession velocity. This object is so far away from us, it's receding from us at approximately twice the speed of light. And yes, that is allowable. Nothing can move through space faster than light can move through space. But space itself is expanding and the galaxies are along for the ride. So the distance between us and the galaxy is increasing because the universe is expanding. So the recession velocity of this object is twice the speed of light. It's mind-bending to think how did the light ever reach us when the object itself is receding from us at twice the speed of light. The look back time, or if you like, the light travel time, how long did it take that light to actually reach us? Well, that took 12.4 billion years, according to our current understanding of the way the universe is expanding. 12.4 billion years, if you remember that the universe is 13.8 billion years old, that means the light that produced this image was traveling for 90% of the lifetime of the universe. The light left long, 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 long before the Earth even existed. Eight billion years before the Earth was born, the light left this galaxy, and it's been traveling all that time ever since. 12.4 billion years. So, not a spectacular image, but as a lockdown challenge, how far, what is the most distant object I could possibly image, that has got to be it, at a distance of 25 billion light years. So, not my most spectacular image, but one that I thought was really amazing once I realised the object was indeed there. Let me finish by take, talk, taking you through a few images taken outside the UK. One reason to go to Africa is because of the wildlife. I like watching wildlife, sometimes with binoculars. And because we're in Africa, a long way from any street lights out in the bush, we can do some astronomy. And again, those same binoculars can be used for looking at the beautiful, unpolluted dark skies. But I'm interested in photography. So photography overlaps with wildlife and I've got a few thousand images of various animals and birds in Africa. And whilst I'm there, I also dabble in photographing the night sky. So photography and wildlife and astronomy all overlap if you go on safari in Africa. And that's one of the reasons I like to take safaris with my friends who, like me, are interested in wildlife astronomy and photography. So the mantra is photographing animals by day, stars by night, and what the hell, sleep when you get home. Make the most of your holiday. So I took my little tracker with me. One advantage of a tracker is it adds very little to your luggage. So if you're taking a camera to take pictures of animals anyway, why not take a tracker? It doesn't add more than, I don't know how many hundred grams it might end up being. But if you take a tracker with you, you can then do night photography as well. Now, when you're in the UK, lining up on the North Celestial Pole to make sure that your tracker is parallel with the Earth's axis, to make sure that as it rotates, it compensates for the Earth's rotation, that's easy in the UK. You have a little app that tells you when you look through this polar scope, that's where the North Celestial Pole is in the centre, and it tells you when you're looking at the North Celestial Pole, Polaris ought to be there through the little telescope. Remember, Polaris is close, but not actually at the North Celestial Pole. It's a little less than one degree away. 
but the app makes it very easy. The app knows where you are because of GPS. It knows the time because of GPS. And so it can tell you where you need to plonk Polaris to make sure you're lined up. That's fine. But if you take a holiday to East Africa, you have a problem because the North Celestial Pole is directly above the North Pole of the Earth. And at 52 degrees latitude in the UK, excuse me, in the UK, it's easy enough to see Polaris and line up your equatorial mount or your star tracker. But if you're in East Africa, close to the equator, well, Polaris is very close to the horizon and probably hidden behind an elephant or some hills. And you can't really see the South Pole either, so that really doesn't help. So you have to find some <clears throat> creative ways of lining up a tracker or indeed your uh, equatorial mount if you want to take one with you because you can't see the pole. So there are ways you can do that and I'll certainly answer questions later if you prefer. But it is possible to get the tracker set up and get it roughly aligned to the pole even if you can't see Polaris and then you can do your astrophotography. So I've tried that from Africa. The Large Magellanic Cloud is relatively close to the South Pole so as seen from the equator, it's actually quite low on the horizon, but it was high enough that I managed to catch this image. Again, not a very long telephoto lens. An 85 millimeter lens is barely more than a standard lens. And that again reminds you that some objects in the night sky are actually relatively large and you don't need a large amount of magnification in order to catch these objects. So there's the Magellanic Cloud and the rather bright Tarantula Nebula on the left hand side there. The Milky Way itself is stunningly bright when you get away from light pollution. This is my attempt to give you an idea of the contrast that you can expect. As seen from the UK, when you step outside and let your eyes adapt, you can see the Milky Way running through the sky and you might be able to see the brightest part of the Milky Way and the, uh, the rift that forms in Cygnus. But the Milky Way, as seen from a dark sky site, is so much brighter. It's difficult to put into words just how bright the Milky Way looks when you get away from light pollution. By eye, with the naked eye, you can see all of the structure that you would indicate in this particular image. You can see all of the dark dust lanes, all of these little wispy filaments that are obscuring some of the light from the more distant stars. And of course, as well as being able to see a huge amount of detail with your naked eye, by taking photographs, you not only capture that detail, but you manage to bring out the colour which you can't see with your eyes. Your naked eye doesn't pick up colour because the colour receptors in your eyes don't work at low light levels. But the camera can integrate and it can show you the colour that's in the sky. This, for comparison, that's the image I obtained uh, a few years back when I took the Milky Way from Africa. But in an earlier attempt, I actually tried slide film. And just for comparison, here's the slide film. So there, there's so much detail, it's difficult actually to see the brighter stars because so many faint stars and so much of the nebulosity of the Milky Way come through. But if we compare with slide film I took a few years earlier, the bright stars are easily visible. Perhaps many of you will recognize the constellation of Scorpius, the S shape and the sting in the tail here and the claws of the scorpion. And some of you might recognize this asterism of the teapot. But the Milky Way itself hardly shows at all because slide film and indeed colour print film, is relatively insensitive. So you can pick up the brighter stars, but it's not so good for picking up the faint part of the Milky Way. But digital photography that we've seen here in the background is quite the opposite. It is so sensitive, you can pick up all of these faint stars and the nebulosity of the Milky Way. So many, in fact, it's difficult to see the brighter stars. Sometimes it's literally difficult to see the constellations because there are so many faint stars. And Scorpius is indeed here. If I point it out to you, it's a little more obvious. There's Scorpius 
there's the bright star Antares and the M4 globular cluster. There's the sting in the tail just next to the brightest part of the Milky Way. So yes, all the same information is in there, but with digital photography, you get so much more than you could possibly get purely with either print or slide film. If we have a closer look at this part of the Milky Way, the centre of the galaxy is here somewhere. So buried deep in there is a supermassive black hole, which of course we can't possibly see with a simple wide angle shot of the Milky Way. But we are picking up various other interesting objects. For instance, we have a couple of interlopers here. We have Jupiter and Saturn. This was taken a few years ago when Jupiter and Saturn hadn't yet come into conjunction. Not only that, but when you take a wide angle of the sky, you can then sit down and start identifying all of the other star clusters and nebulae that are in the image. So, for instance, we have M16, the Eagle Nebula, M17, the Swan or the Omega Nebula. We've got uh, the Lagoon Nebula, the Triffid Nebula, etc. There are so many, I can't possibly point them all out. The only ones I've shown here are the Messier numbers. There's no point in attempting to show the NGC numbers because there would simply be so many of them. You get the impression here when you look at all of these Messier objects, you get the impression that all the interesting stuff is in the top left and there's nothing interesting in the bottom right. That simply reminds us that uh, Messier, when he did all of his observing, he did it from France and as seen from France, he can't see any further south than that yellow line. So there are no Messier objects down there, not because there aren't any interesting objects, but simply because Messier could not see them from home. I thought it might be worth trying not just a wide angle shot, but having taken a few wide angles, I thought, well, I have captured the Lagoon and the Triffid Nebula there, shown by the red rectangle. So I wondered, is it possible is it worth it to switch from a wide angle lens to a telephoto lens and then try capturing just the lagoon and the triffid? On the night I tried this, I had problems. It was a very windy night and unfortunately I couldn't take a whole series of images. So this, as you might notice from the caption at the bottom, again taken with a 300mm lens, it is a single 30 second exposure. So this particular image here of M8 Lagoon and M20 Triffid is not a whole load of images stacked together in software. This is a single 30 second JPEG image. No darks, no flats, just a single exposure. And even with that, you can pick out a multitude of stars and you actually get quite nicely the color, the pink color of the Lagoon and the pink and blue color of the Triffid. It's pushing my luck a bit, but if we blow up the Triffid Nebula, you can see that the pink and the blue are indeed there. But we're pretty much at the limit of what we can do in terms of zooming in to a 300mm lens on a camera sitting on the back of a tracker. So the take home message is astrophotography. Yes, if you've got enough money and you want to throw money at the problem, you can get some fantastic telescopes and mounts and astro cameras. But why not just think about it? If you've already got a camera, why not try taking pictures of the sky using a tracker that you can make yourself for a few tens of pounds? Or you can buy yourself a tracker for a hundred pounds or two hundred pounds or whatever you want to pay for a tracker, such as the ioptron shown in the inset there especially if you're going somewhere dark. If you're going somewhere dark in the UK on a holiday or you're going abroad and you're getting away from streetlights, why not think of packing a little tracker with you so that you can make the most of the wonderful dark skies that exist around the world? Astrophotography is not just for those who have thousands of pounds to spare. It can be for those who want to do it on the cheap. Thank you very much for listening.